Um, I, I don't know if um, you heard that I have studied wolves for a long time, 57 years actually, and for 57 years there have been these kind of meetings. And I wasn't going to tell this story, but after hearing Mike's presentation, I thought, no, I can't resist, I have to tell this story. Uh, the Many, many years ago in the 1970s, uh, there were um, still wolves in Minnesota at that time, and um, there were problems with wolves. And we were holding a meeting uh, to see what could be done about wolves killing livestock. And um, on one side of the room were many people who uh, Mike would call mutualists. Uh, they are, at that time, we called them animal rights people. And on the other side of the room, there were what Mike calls utilitarians. Uh, they were the hunters and the trappers and the ranchers. And as we were pondering how to prevent wolves from killing livestock, suddenly a little old lady on one side of the room raised her hand and said, Dr. Meech, Dr. Meech, can't you just catch those wolves and castrate them? <laughs> and I was trying to think about how can I answer this woman diplomatically when on the other side of the room a grizzled old trapper, he stood up and he said, ma'am, I don't think you understand the situation. Those wolves out there, they're trying to kill those sheep, not have sex with them. <laughs> you inspired me to tell that story, Mike. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about the lessons that we have learned from the wolf reintroduction into Yellowstone Park. And you need to have some background uh, to really understand this. Nas our national parks um, have a, a law that uh, we should minimize human intervention into the, the parks themselves, so we shouldn't do anything that's unnatural. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the government did do something that was unnatural. Uh, by 1930, it killed off all the wolves in Yellowstone Park. That was part of what was going on all across the western United States, and that included Yellowstone. Because the government actually killed off the wolves in Yellowstone, then by law it was okay to return wolves to Yellowstone. That would not be considered intervention, it's just restoring something we made a mistake doing originally. It took about 20 years more, actually, of lobbying environmental impact statements and lawsuits of various types uh, before uh, the public and Congress was ready for us to reintroduce uh, wolves there. But the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal uh, law, uh, helped a great deal in uh, persuading the public that wolves should be restored to Yellowstone National Park. But because the wolf was listed as an endangered species in 1967 and protected by the second act, and uh, the act was passed in 1974, 1973, but the wolf was protected in uh, 1974, um, because of that, um, the Endangered Species Act said it was okay to restore wolves to, uh, in fact, not just okay, but uh, the public Congress should restore wolves uh, to places where they had been before, and Yellowstone was a prime uh, location for that. Now, at that time, uh, the stakeholders um, all got together as part of this environmental impact statement and recovery plans that we, the government put together, and they agreed that uh, we needed to have a population of about 300 wolves before those, they could consider that the population would be recovered and could be taken off or delisted from the federal endangered species uh, list. And then they would be returned to state management. It had to have a minimum of 300 wolves uh, in, um, for, a, for a period of at least three years, three consecutive years. Now, Yellowstone was a prime place for reintroducing wolves, uh, especially because they had such a huge population of elk, actually about between, at that time, 16,000 and 19,000 elk, and um, at that time about 2,000 bison. So there was plenty for wolves to eat there. So we took wolves from um, uh, two places in Canada and reintroduced them, dropped them into Yellowstone Park and to central Idaho. That was also part of the agreement. 
And this is what the area looked like in Canada where we got the wolves. Uh, we had a team of about 30 people, and some of them we brought from Alaska, uh, other specialists, and we had aircraft and um, uh, hunted the wolves with uh, dart uh, rifles and darted them, trapped them, snared them, and brought them in. This, uh, we darted them from helicopters and all, and as you see way over on uh, the extreme side, we, we got great numbers of them. Uh, we tried to get individual packs so that we could transplant an entire pack into the park, actually three entire packs. Loaded them into vehicles, placed them in pens, and held them while we got more wolves. It took several, several days to do this. And then finally, when we had enough, uh, we drugged them all and put radio collars on them, vaccinated them, took blood samples, and examined them in many different ways, uh, and then uh, got them ready to put into a large aircraft, flew them down to both central Idaho and Yellowstone National Park. And in, uh, we had two types of releases. In Yellowstone, it didn't matter where the wolves went when we dropped them off because the wilderness there was so large we wanted them anywhere they wanted to go. In Yellowstone we needed the wolves to stay in the park so we couldn't just, we knew from experience and with other reintroductions that we couldn't just drop them off uh, like we did in Idaho but rather we had to hold them in pens. So we held them in each pack in a different pen and fed them uh, by uh, a mule train, we had to take uh, uh, mules uh, into, with, a, with sledge into the pens with uh, road killed uh, elk and deer uh, and try to minimize the exposure of the wolves to any people. We didn't want them to be tame when they came out of the pens. And then, oh and I should say, and, uh, this got great notice and even President Clinton came over and looked at the wolves and kind of endorsed the program. Uh, now, when it came time to release the wolves, they didn't want to leave the pen. And in fact, uh, the public called them government welfare wolves. Uh, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, we cut holes in the fence, we placed carcasses just outside the holes, and eventually the wolves came out and um, started uh, gathering their own food. It didn't take them long and they started uh, killing. This is the first elk that they killed within uh, half a day after leaving the pen. Uh, even if they couldn't kill elk, there was plenty of food around in the form of bison that were just dying because uh, they were either too old or, the, or starving, and, and so the wolves had carrion to eat as well. So there was plenty of food there for the wolves. So the first thing they did is form territories. Uh, you heard uh, Alika uh, tell you about the wolves uh, having territories. Well, that's exactly what our three packs of wolves, they form territories in the, um, in the northeast corner of Yellowstone Park and began feeding on this massive number of elk. And their population, the wolf population, just look at the uh, longest bar here, uh, just kept increasing over the years very quickly because they had all this food uh, to supply them. And within a few years, they multiplied and we had many different uh, packs of wolves uh, living throughout Yellowstone Park. The agreement, recall, you recall, was that we had to have, in order to remove the wolves from the endangered species list and return them to state management, we had to have at least 300 wolves uh, for at least three con consecutive years. And that, they were to be distributed in each of three uh, recovery areas, the Yellowstone Park area, central Idaho, and northwestern Montana. And that was, was the agreement. However, um, by, because of, of um, the extreme differences in the viewpoints toward wolves, the people who really wanted wolves to remain protected and not subject to state management, but rather to be continued protected by the Federal Endangered Species Act, they sued the government uh, and prevented the wolves from coming off uh, the, the endangered species uh, list. So 
the wolves could have come off the list at about this point in, the, in their population curve. Instead, they continue to increase because they continue to be protected by the Federal Endangered Species Act rather than managed by individual states. In fact, this population increased like this despite the fact that there were over 2,000 wolves, about 2,300 wolves that were being killed for depredation control because they were killing livestock. And still the population continued to increase. However, after the wolf was first, uh, the government attempted to take him off the list and then the lawsuits happened, they were put on the list, and then the government took them off the list again and there were more lawsuits, put them back on the list, they were off the list again and three times they were off the list in this area, not just Yellowstone Park but around the area. And the, every time they were protected again, they continued to increase. Uh, in a couple of years, they were off the list for two years, and Montana and Idaho had hunting seasons. And uh, during that time, another 2,000 wolves were killed. Still, the population continued to increase. Even though they were released in these two areas, this is how the population spread as it increased. You saw from some of the early discussions how far and wide wolves uh, can disperse. And that's what's been happening in that area. So we started with just a few in Yellowstone and central Idaho. Uh, and now, as of 2015, they have colonized parts of Washington, Oregon, much of, of um, Idaho and uh, Montana and Wyoming. And, and just recently, uh, they have moved into northern California. Now, many of you know about a wolf called OR7, which uh, actually dispersed from northeastern, uh, actually northeastern Oregon here, and made its way down to California, and then turned around and went back, and then stayed there and had some pups. Well, that's n he's not the father of this uh, newfound pack in California. Some other wolf that was not radio collared went down there with another wolf, or met another wolf there, and they started a new pack. So this is one that isn't even radioed, but there is a uh, population now in um, northeast, northern California. The wolf is still on the list um, in, out in Oregon, Washington, California, and Wyoming. But because of the problems with the delisting, the folks in Montana and Idaho uh, had Congress delist the wolf, that is, take it off the list in a special manner, just legislatively, uh, in a way that it could not be uh, re put back on the list through lawsuits. That could not, be, uh, could not be a mechanism for protecting it again. So that's what's happened over the West. But otherwise, the wolf is still on the list, uh, except in Montana and um, Idaho, federal list. Now, another uh, factor that, or another uh, subject that you may have heard much about is um, the claims that there, are, uh, in, in Yellowstone, the wolves have caused a uh, trophic cascade. A trophic cascade is just um, uh, a, a, a process by which, say, in this case, wolves reduce the number of elk, which we now have found is true, and uh, by reducing the number of elk, uh, increase the vegetation, and then with an increased vegetation, it's claimed then that um, as the, it, vegetation recovers, uh, that the uh, birds and, the, um, and beavers and all that depend on the vegetation increase. Uh, so that's been uh, um, touted fairly widely by the popular media, when National Geographic and the New York Times and, and uh, on the YouTube and all. Uh, but actually, there's some, uh, some question about how valid the findings are about these trophic cascades in Yellowstone. Uh, there's 16 articles that have been published uh, that are kind of claiming that, the, uh, uh, that there are these trophic cascades that are, are evidenced there, uh, but there's also 11 articles uh, challenging them. So this is unsettled science. Probably there's some truth to it, but um, it's not, probably not as uh, simple as it has been made out, especially in the popular literature. Now, um, 
they're, they're both uh, positive and negative effects of, of wolf recovery. And um, the positive effects you see here uh, that helps restore the natural uh, park e ecosystem and park visitors enjoy seeing wolves. This is certainly true. There's thousands of people who go to Yellowstone every year to view wolves and they really enjoy watching the wolves and uh, there's no question that this is a very positive effect of having um, wolves there. In fact, the um, economics of this has been well measured and uh, the estimate is that uh, wolf ecotourism in Yellowstone uh, has been, uh, uh, has accounted for about a $35 million annual increase in the local economy. Um, on the other hand, there's these negative effects that we've already heard about. Uh, wolves do kill livestock and the hunters and the guides can claim and probably with some validity that wolves have reduced the the elk in their area and um, made it harder for them to do their jobs to to guide hunters and etc. So there's both these positive and nev negative effects from that. I want to look a little more closely at the um, livestock depredation claims. Uh, now um, we all know wolves kill livestock and and all and I just want to put this in some perspective. This pertains to Minnesota or these figures are from Minnesota but they, they are also very similar to what we found out in the West. If you look at this graph, there's 28,000 little tiny squares. Took me a long time to count them, but there's 20, you have to just agree, there's 28,000 there. That's from one end to the other, little, little tiny squares, 28,000. Each one of them represent 10 head of livestock. Okay, so there's really uh, livestock in Minnesota wolf range. So there's about 280,000 or actually 290,000 head of livestock in wolf range. Of those 290,000, uh, only one on average is killed per year. So it's very, very a small percentage of any livestock depredation. Uh, but if you're the rancher that, if you're the rancher that lives in the area where the wolves have killed their livestock, it's very important. So you, you know, there's, looked at holistically, it's not a big issue. But looked at from the individual standpoint, uh, it, it does have an effect on some of these families. And I'm sure the case, this is the case uh, in, in Europe as well, um, but it's the same problem. Well, you certainly have the idea that there are these two different views of wolves by now. Some people tend to see the wolf this way, and other people tend to see it that way. And uh, what happens in these cases is you get this polarization that uh, Mike mentioned, and the, and the um, polarization is between the utilitarians or the consumptive users and the animal rights or the mutualist types. And because of this polarization, uh, you get this spread of misinformation. Each side, the, the, the extreme ends of this continuum, of each uh, side of the continuum, the extreme ends uh, tend to produce a lot of misinformation. Uh, to the, the, the kind of misinformation that tends to bolster their own beliefs. So you get this one, uh, one side that says wolves kill for fun or for sport. And that isn't true. Wolves, it's very dangerous for wolves to hunt uh, large prey, and many wolves have been killed by the prey themselves. They don't hunt for fun, they hunt for food. Uh, and on the other hand, there's a, oh, this other misinformation, there's a big um, video on, um, on YouTube, uh, many of you have seen it, I know millions of people have seen it, Wolves Save Rivers, and it makes you think that without wolves we wouldn't even have any clean rivers out there. Uh, things aren't quite that simple. Um, now, to try to counter this basic propaganda from both sides of the continuum of beliefs, uh, we, we set up the International Wolf Center. Um, just, I won't dwell on it, but uh, to publish a magazine, we have a center in Ely, Minnesota. Some of you I know have been there, uh, and uh, we have a website you can see there. Uh, so that, um, we're, we're hoping, uh, you'll recall that Mike's answer to the last question is, Maybe education can help change some minds. Maybe education can help change viewpoints. And um, I, I don't think it can for, on the extremes, but I think, I think it can help in the middle. The people who are uncommitted, have not an un, that do not have an uncommitted belief, I think that through educating them about scientific, science-based information about wolves, 
that, um, that, that we will be able to allow them to have a uh, less biased view of the wolf. I've spent most of my career, um, the backbone of it has been looking at uh, how wolves are able to manage um, to make a living despite the fact that they kill these large prey that are very dangerous. And um, the main reason or the main way they do this is by be, being very selective in the individuals they kill. Um, in, in common terms, we say the wolves kill the old, the young, the sick, and the weak. You've all heard that. Basically, it's true. And um, uh, this is, we've gathered these figures for the entire duration of my career. Uh, but I used to think, up until 10 years ago, I used to think that the way this happened was that um, the, the wolves just chased, say, a herd, and a weak one would kind of fall behind, and so automatically the wolves would end up catching that one or concentrating on that one. And um, uh, not that they deliberately did this, but that they just, uh, it happened mechanistically. But it turns out, in a way I'm going to show you dramatically here, um, it not just, it isn't that they just me mechanistically uh, select prey, but they deliberately, in some cases anyway, deliberately select prey. And I'm going to demonstrate that by showing you a short video made by Bob Landis in Yellowstone National Park. And this is two wolves hunting elk. It's a seven minute film. They're going to kill this elk. If you don't want to watch it die, you close your eyes. But uh, here's what's going on here. The, um, this is a 22 month old wolf is with a pack, but you don't see the rest of the pack because they're chasing other elk around other places. Uh, and um, what this one is doing, it's not running real fast and you see it's going by passing up many different elk. And it's joined by a litter mate. We know which one that is too. That one's 22 months old. So these wolves had about a year of experience in chasing elk. And you see they're just loping along, passing up a lot of elk. What we think they're doing is they're looking, they're scanning the herd for one they think they can kill with a minimal amount of danger to themselves. Uh, the sounds you hear are ravens ravens that follow the wolves around. Now, all of a sudden, this wolf, you see, he, spe he speeds up. He spotted something, and in a few minutes, you'll be able to see what it is about this elk that this wolf sees. He's got one targeted. In a minute, you'll, you'll be able to see him pick it out. All right, so here we go. This is, this is the target now. Wolf puts on a big burst of speed. Keep watching the right hind leg of that elk. You see it flopping? Now remember, those wolves have to try to kill that elk without getting killed themselves. And you see how the elk is striking out with his hooves. Uh, elk have killed at least 10 wolves now in Yellowstone Park. So th these wolves are not doing this for fun. They are serious and they could be killed. That's one that one thinks is going to have dinner soon. Now watch.
watch that right hind foot now. See how it's hard to put down? I don't know if that those raven calls get translated or not, but... So they have it down and, and it, it's dying here and will be dead very soon. And the other members of the pack will uh, now uh, come running over and, and help them feed on it. Um, but, and so we, we let that happen. And um, then when they were done feeding on it, uh, we, we looked at its remains. And uh, you, you can see here that the reason for that um, bum, that um, bad right hind foot or leg, was this arthritis in the knee joint. Uh, it's all arthritis, and this, this was a five-year-old elk, and um, this arthritis was, we're not sure how the elk got the arthritis, but the big point is that the wolves saw that, just as we could see it, and targeted that individual animal. That was the first time we knew that um, it's possible that instead of all this happening mechanistically, at least some of it happens deliberately as the wolves seek out a, a special animal that they can kill, minimizing the damage or the danger to themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you.